Welcome everybody. We are hosting this third mastermind call and this is the first time that we are recording so we can share with the rest of the world what is happening in our world. So I am Stephanie Boldrini. I'm the co-host of the real estate, um, commercial real estate investing from HZ podcast and I'm primarily focused on self-storage and retail properties. And this year, I will be definitely heavily focused in California. So I'll go ahead and get started with my update. Um, from my end, I will be sharing what is happening here where I live in San Francisco, which is most likely happening in cities like New York City. Today, the city is a ghost town. Nobody wants to quarantine in poor walls with no access to work at a coffee shop or in common areas of their buildings. Nothing is happening in these common areas of the buildings. We're not even allowed to go there. And people have to still wear masks going outside. So a lot of people are moving out of the city. There are deals in the rental space that are completely unheard of and we would have never imagined they would be happening. Like one to two months off, uh, and significant discounts on apartments. My friend, for instance, moved out of a four and a half thousand a month junior one bedroom that is now in the market for 3,000. So that's a 30% rent decrease. And there are a ton of units available because nobody is moving into the city. So lots of deals in, in condos and things like that and, and apartments. So why do I mention that, you know, when I'm not in the residential space? obviously because it has a trickle down effect in businesses. Most businesses are still closed or doing very little business. As far as retail, I have a very good friend that owns quite a few properties here in San Francisco and he is getting rent from only 20 25% of his tenants. He also has some notes that are outstanding and are not being paid. And these are for properties here in California. Yes, the deals are already happening. I already saw a retail pro property for sale at a 10.9% pro forma cap rate in San Francisco at $373, $373 per square foot. And there is also, a, a, I came across a, a boutique hotel at over 10% pro forma, uh, obviously as well here in San Francisco. I spoke with uh, someone who tracks um, CMBS uh, uh, rates and they have a 24% delinquency rates in hotels as of I believe this month. So California is yes a very difficult state to deal with in many levels and San Francisco is even worse. Prior to COVID they were talking about implementing a fine for retail space that has been vacant for X number of months and right now on the ballot, as some of you may know, Prop 15 for the second time comes back to tax all commercial properties based on their current market value. So the only exception is agricultural, multifamily, and if you own less than $3 million in properties here. Given all of this, I still think that it is still an incredible opportunity to invest here, especially now. The people that are moving out are moving out temporarily. It is my belief that young professionals will always want to live near in larger cities that actually have a good social life and it's easy to go to. And I strongly believe that companies like Facebook and Google will never be this gigantic, will never be built without really stay. So given all of this, I will be raising a significant fund for the remainder of the year in order to be prepared to take advantage of all these deals. And as we all know, opportunities like this only come every 10 years. Um, I also want to highlight, I know Lo wasn't able to make it today. He mentioned something really interesting in terms of strategic investing. He said that you should invest in blue cities in red states. And I think that's a very good approach. 
And I also wanted to highlight and maybe invite Victor at a later point who is on this call to talk about uh, some of the uh, ways that he has created deals basically out of thin air. And uh, I watched him do a presentation and it was phenomenal. So with that, I'm going to pass to Todd to give his update. Okay, and uh, maybe Andrew, I don't know, if, I know you said you might have to jump off the call a little bit early if you had a call come in. So do you wanna uh, give your update and introduction? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andrew Lenoy, I'm here in Phoenix. Um, just, I guess I'll just talk about the local market. Uh, the cases got really bad the last two weeks. I think we're number one or two, maybe behind Florida. Um, restaurants, I think, are still open for the most part. They closed down the gyms. The, a lot of business owners are fighting back against the, the governor to stay open, which has been pretty interesting. Um, in, our, in our world, we own and operate mobile home parks, uh, collections, uh, in general have been down a, a little bit, not too bad. A lot of parts of our business have, have been frozen. We sent our construction company home and um, as everyone knows, some of the lending kind of dried up a little bit. Some lenders are back in, some kind of stayed the same through all this. Um, so we're just figuring out how to get back into acquisition mode and all of the um, CapEx and all the projects and things that we have in, in our world for our, our portfolio. So we haven't really uh, been traveling. We haven't sent anyone out. Um, and then in, in lieu of all, all of these new uh, developments in the past couple of weeks, um, we're just trying to figure out uh, how to get really back to work with, uh, with a, lot of our, a lot of our team. We sent everyone home about um, four months ago to um, so we've got office space that's sitting like uh, a lot of people. So very, very interesting times to say the least. Okay, I'll go ahead and uh, introduce myself. Yeah, I'm Todd Solzinger. I manage Blue Elm Investments, uh, which, which is also a mobile home park operator. Uh, and I also work for as a consultant for a company called CCI Investments that does uh, mobile home park consulting and property management. And uh, in, in our parks, we've we've had some struggles with collections as well. Uh, in, uh, I have parks in Georgia and Tennessee, so and we've had more issues with collections in Georgia. And it's been a combination of tenants who, uh, some tenants were affected by COVID related situations where they, uh, they lost their jobs due to the pandemic. And in those situations, we reached out to them and said, okay, if you actually were, then you know, please fill out this form, get proof from your employer that your job was affected by, uh, by the pandemic. In other cases, we've had people we think, take advantage of the fact that the courts have been closed. So uh, I think in Georgia, around the end of March, the governor froze evictions. Uh, so all the tenants, or many tenants were aware of that and stopped paying rent. So the courts opened back up in the middle of July. Um, or sorry, middle of, sorry, middle to end of June. So we've started the eviction process for a few of our tenants and uh, tried to work with them as much as possible to arrange payment plans, not go through that process. Uh, but for some of those, we had to start. Um, we're not sure how long that process is gonna take. We imagine it's gonna take longer than it normally would because there's been a backup in the, uh, the courts, not just related to evictions, but also related to a lot of other court-related activities. So, uh, time will tell kind of over the next month or so how things go with making our way uh, through that process for some of our residents. There's still been good demand for, for new tenants though. That's, uh, uh, you know, we always talk in the mobile home park business about it being recession resistant. And it's, this is a different kind of, of recession. You know, when we think about a re, uh, recession resistancy, you think about that there's always going to be uh, demand for jobs uh, at a lower wage level, whether that be restaurants, uh, nail salons, barbers, all those kind of things that you think are uh, always pretty secure. In this environment, they're not. So it is a uh, a different kind of uh, you know or a different kind of um, uh, economic recession that we're in right now that that has affected some of our uh, tenants that are on the lower income spectrum. Um, but that seems to have been offset by some of the homes that we've, uh, when we do have vacant homes, and we actually brought in some newer, uh, sorry, some refurbished homes 
to rent and the demand for those has been been strong. So it's been an interesting combination of still a continued high demand for affordable housing with people that have been uh, affected by the by the downturn. Um, kind of interesting on, on the other side, on my on the mobile home park consulting business uh, side of the, the business I work on, there's still a strong demand from buyers out there. Uh, I think you sometimes you do hear a sentiment of people just waiting on the sidelines, uh, waiting to see what happens over the next six to nine months with with pricing. And there, that, that still is happening out there. But we're also seeing a really strong demand from individuals, small partnerships, family offices who are looking to acquire parks and they're contacting us wanting to uh, start, you know, start that process and are really active on the acquisition side. So that's a, that's a positive to see that there's still activity in the, in the mobile home park business where people still find it to be something that they think is worthwhile investing and building a business around. Thank you, Todd. Beth, do you want to go next? Sure. My name is Beth Azor and I'm in the South Florida area, the hot spot in more ways than one. Uh, I own six retail shopping centers and a lot's going on in our industry and in our community. Um, we've had a ton of retail bankruptcies from Tuesday morning, Pier 1, uh, Asena is about to file 24-Hour Fitness, GNC, Gold's Gym, Bed Bath & Beyond just announced they're closing 200 stores. Starbucks will probably be closing 400 stores. Uh, the national um, deal making it will be on hold until 2021 because of the inability to travel. So anyone that owns shopping centers looking to fill retail space in the next six to nine months will be focusing on local and regional players. So uh, that's what we're doing, you know, doing maybe some short term leases. There is activity. There's a lot of fast casual restaurants that are doing uh, crazy volumes with to go and curbside. So uh, there is activity for new, uh, new retail but um, retail's been hit hard, obviously. Um, as far as the pandemic, we just instituted a curfew of 10 p.m., re-instituted re-institu it uh, yesterday in South Florida. Uh, we are fragmented, we have seven million people, we're fragmented into three areas, Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and West Palm. Miami uh, announced that they were going to close indoor and outdoor dining and gyms and then they had such a huge um, uh, fight on their hands with the restaurant community and the gym community that they agreed to let the gyms open with masks and limited uh, occupancy. And then they opened back up outdoor dining. So that, um, that there would have been riots. So they, they curbed that. And then Fort Lauderdale, where my properties are located, they instituted a 10 p.m. curfew, no food and drink after 10 p.m., and uh, they will punish the violators. So if you don't have masks and you don't have, and you exceed the occupancy, they will shut you down for 24 hours um, if you violate it the first time. And if they catch you again, it will be 72 hours every time they catch you, no warning. So we as landlords and owners of properties like that because we're punishing the violators versus you know, the whole industry. Um, REITs, public REITs around the country are putting away millions of dollars to save and help their tenants. Uh, one REIT is trying to negotiate with PPP to get $200 million to be the conduit to help save mom and pop businesses uh, that has fallen thus far on deaf ears. Another REIT has earmarked 10 million for restaurants and another REIT has earmarked 6 million. So creating pools and escrows of their own money to help out what has been and has become the current traffic driver at most shopping centers where 10 years ago, food and beverage was less than 10% of a shopping center. It has grown in the last five years to 50. So being that there are tra traffic driver, if the owner of the shopping center or the landlord feels that that tenant is worth saving, that they're gonna be here after the vaccine, landlords are 
pretty much going to become the savior and, and save them and, and help prop them up beyond just a rent deferral or a rent waiver. Um, across the country, we, there's a report that is, gets published of um, national tenant uh, rent payments. And on average, I think they're about 80%. There are certain uh, groups that are not paying at all, um, but I would say it's about 80%. In my portfolio, I'm at about 88% but my portfolio is heavily weighted with non-national tenants. Definitely, um, it was, it's been a lot easier dealing with my mom and pops than it's been dealing with the nationals. And, we, and all of us pro retail property owners are anxious to see what happens to credit. <laughs> you know, cr you, you do the, the big national deal at the lower rent and the big tenant improvement dollars and the huge co-tenancy provisions because the national tenants would always say we're the ones you can count on and we have all learned now in COVID that they're not the ones you can count on actually. Um, uh, lenders for retail, all community bank lenders will have deferred 90 days mortgages. You know some early on people were getting IO deals, interest only. I you know published blogs all the time and I said, go back, you can get full deferrals. Pretty much if you asked your community lender, they gave you full 90 day deferrals. They are reaching out back now in South Florida, offering more deferrals, just putting it on the end of their on the end of your mortgage terms, not CMBS. Uh, there's no deals with C CMBS. And if you call your CMBS lender, you will be put on um, the bad list and you don't want to get on that list. So if you have a CMBS loan, you're paying your mortgage, even if you're having to pay it out of your pocket. There have been no deals, staff at all, uh, yet we're all waiting. We're all waiting for those deals, but there's been no deals yet. We do see a huge default coming with CMBS loans. So those of us that have capital that want to acquire more are waiting, but there's no big deals. Um, in one of my centers, I lost a Kirkland's and my, my vacancy went from eight to 21%. It's a small center. And I dropped my rents from 50 to 40 uh, because I want to lease space. Um, so there's been, but there hasn't been a lot of write downs yet on rents. In the Miami office market, I think this is very interesting. I have a friend who owns a boutique office leasing and management firm. She's she is working currently with 200,000 square feet of new office requests as a tenant rep broker from New York, Chicago, and Dallas. 200,000 square feet. That would be a new absorption that beat the last six months of 2019 in, in Miami. So that's a pretty big number. However, even though that would be great new absorption, we do have the empty Class A office buildings where you have the public companies that are not bringing their people back to work. They're ghost towns, like you said. And you have the flight to suburbia from the C and D asset class office buildings that don't have good air quality or have smaller elevator caps. Because what we're seeing in high rise office buildings, they, the, the, um, the COVID police and the fire departments are creating uh, elevator appointments. So they're limiting four people to an elevator. And if you miss your you know, 907 elevator appointment ride up, you then go back to the end of the queue. This is all in preparation of when businesses are coming back. And if you work for a public company, who knows um, when that's gonna happen. She has said they're starting to get some calls on some rent discussions, but very, very few, unlike the retail world. Um, new developments are dead in the water. If you don't have a shovel in the ground, it's going to be two to three years for sure. And um, I think that's it for my report. <laughs> but so the positives are activity is up, um, not with nationals. You, you know, you're kicking the can on that, any nationals because they can't, none of their companies are allowing them to travel. And if they won't let them go see sites, they can't get go to real estate committee. So uh, we're not, we're looking for national deals to not happen until 2022. And Beth, why are you finding it that, that it's been easier dealing with the mom and pop tenants versus the nationals? They have a conscience. So um, I have 59 tenants and Todd for the first, the first four weeks 
were, you know, we got bombarded, I would say, starting in the fourth or fifth week. And I was talking to tenants every day. I literally, for my own mental health, had to bifurcate the calls I was having with mom and pops and the calls I was having with nationals. I literally picked days that Tuesday is the day I'll talk to mom and pops where I'm literally talking them off ledges. They're crying on the phone. I'm propping them up because I don't want mass exodus. And they're feeling so bad that, and they, that they can't pay my rent. To, on Wednesdays, I'm talking to national corporate, you know, big companies who are saying, we're not going to pay for 12 months. What are you going to do about it? And have no conscience. They could care less. And I, at one, when this first started, I would be like, you know, talking someone off a ledge, they're crying and then being, you know, com- spoken to completely rudely. So I realized for my own mental state, I had to, I had a time block so that I could shore up, you know, when I talked to the nationals versus the mom and pops. Yes. Okay. So we'll get through it. Uh, the good, the good news is when we did reopen on May 18th, the pent up demand was unbelievable. People came out uh, in full force, sales were up, parking lots were full. So I think that, um, a, you know, a gentleman on CNBC three mornings set ago said in January, this is all be, will all be behind us. I hope and pray that it is. So we're basically landlords of retail have to just um, tread water, keep their tenants in, you know, I had a, a hair salon and you're right, personal services, you know, if you're a restaurant and you can do curbside or you can do delivery or you have a retail uh, op- operation where you can do online sales, they're all, you know, they can maintain some semblance of business. The hair salons, you know, they haven't pushed, you know, a cash register in four months. So they reopened, had a great groundswell, great uh, pent up demand, and now people are canceling left and right. And that was the call that I had today. And I just said, look, don't worry about rent for the next until January. Just don't worry about it. I, you know, I said, well, what are you going to do for income? Well, I'll go, you know, rent a small, you know, chair in a salon suite somewhere. I go, well, don't go pay rent to someone else. Just, you know, let's just work it out. So any landlord that's smart is going to help their tenants if they can. If you have a CMBS loan and you don't have the capital put aside to make to weather through the next four to six months. I guess you're giving the keys back or, you know, go find a partner because there will be people like me that will be out there that will, that for the right opportunity will help because you, you cannot mess around with the CMBS lender. I, I will ne- I have two of my six. I'll never do it again. Thank you so much. Thank you. Victor, would you go next? I think your comments on uh, forbearance are very interesting and I think a lot of businesses that, um, and just to comment on, on 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 what Beth was talking about, are are spot on. A lot of businesses that are in the bond market are finding that there's no provision in a bond for any kind of forbearance. Whereas if you're dealing with a lender that is an actual bona fide lender, you've got a lot more flexibility. And so there is that dramatic difference, in particular in the world of commercial. And that's why Hertz is in bankruptcy. Um, you know, a lot of businesses that have not been able to work it out with their bondholders. So I think that's spot on. So um, hi everyone, I'm Victor Manash. I'm uh, the host of the Real Estate Espresso podcast, uh, author of the book, Magnetic Capital, uh, based here in Ottawa, Canada, and a developer in several different locations. Um, unlike what Beth was talking about, we are actually making some progress on getting debt for new construction and even some equity as well. Uh, it's tougher than it was. Uh, we're not doing anything in uh, in retail or office, thankfully, but in uh, in the multifamily and senior housing asset classes, we are able to find both debt and equity. For the moment, it appears as though you know rent collections in multifamily are pretty strong. Of course, that's all been propped up by the fact that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury are shoveling money, helicoptering money over the population pretty liberally. Uh, That's not going to happen indefinitely. And of course, that's a process that does breed some degree of dependence. And so when that stops, uh, that's when things will get interesting. Um, We don't know when that'll be. 
Uh, we're in an, we are in an election year. I don't think either party is going to be want want to be seen as the one that turned off the financial taps. That's not going to win an election for anyone. So I think we've got at least until November of uh, continued money printing. And money printing works until it doesn't. Uh, and when it doesn't, it turns very quickly, at least if you look at history. Uh, and if money, money printing was the path to prosperity, then Venezuela and Zimbabwe would be the richest nations on earth, and they're not. So it's, uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Um, in my market... Uh, of Ottawa, Canada, it's a little bit of a bubble. It's a hot market right now. Um, you know, our inventory is down 49%. Prices are up 14 point something in the in the retail market, 17% in the condo market. Uh, we've got 1,900 units in inventory. Uh, did 2,300 units of volume in the past month, and, or sorry, 2,058 units in the past month, and days on market is hovering a little bit below 30 days. A lot of properties selling multiple offers in one day. So it's like our market hasn't noticed that there's a problem out there. It's kind of bizarre. But Ottawa's a bubble. Federal government um, is the dominant employer, the anchor uh, tenant or the anchor economic driver. And so that I think is probably seeing similar effects in the Washington DC market. Uh, I don't know that, but I suspect you're gonna see very similar type activity there. So um, we've seen um, drops in uh, both uh, Steph and Beth talked about uh, drops in rental rates. Uh, certainly a lot of the coastal cities have seen that. We've not seen it here, Rent, rents are holding. We're up, you know, three bucks a square foot for rents, uh, which is pretty solid. Uh, so it's maintaining maintained the high historic norms, uh, at, least, at least for the past year. Uh, in fact, I had a conversation, uh, staff with someone from, from the Bay Area last week, uh, who, when we were talking about the the rental rates in San Francisco proper dropping an average of nine, nine, nine 10%, but rents in Oakland are up like four or 5%. So what seems to be happening is people are saying, all right, I'm just going to go for something that's cheaper. A bit of a Brooklyn effect happening in Oakland. Uh, and seeing the same thing in Dallas. Uh, Plano and Frisco, kind of the corporate hotbeds. Rents are down 9%. They're up 5% in, uh, in Arlington. So it's, uh, it's uh, you know, that's kind of the, the, the lay of the land right now. Uh, we are still seeing deals. Uh, we're being selective, obviously, um, and we're being cautious. And uh, we know that the market conditions could, could turn again in a heartbeat. So that's kind of it for me. Thank you so much, Victor. RK, you are next. Can I ask Victor a quick question? Sure. Are you not, where are you guys with the pandemic? In Canada, we're doing much, much better than the U.S. Our, our numbers are, you know, we're one-tenth of the population of the U.S. Um, you know, we're having hundreds of cases a day. Okay. Um, I think that's relative, right? That, correct. With the situation with your, with, with the industry, the real estate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there, there, we've got a moratorium on, um, on both evictions and uh, and foreclosures, in my province, there's a backlog of 80,000 cases in front in front of the landlord tenant tribunal for evictions, uh, and of course that's not a complete number because knowing that there's a moratorium, not everyone's going to file. So the real number's obviously higher. Uh, that's a big number. It's going to take a long time to work through. Um, so what's going to happen to those rental properties where the collections are down? I don't know. Um, I expect we're going to start to see something appearing, uh, you know, on the, on the market. Yeah. Okay. You're next. 
Good afternoon. Thank you, Stephanie. Appreciate this opportunity to join you. Um, so I represent the self-storage sector, and uh, I do most of my consulting on a nationwide basis and have everything from a cadre of uh, larger operators down to small independent owner operators, which we used to affectionately call the mom and pops, and now we call them the, the indies. And um, our industry has always been regarded as recession resilient. Uh, it's been one of the reasons why a lot of money flowed to our sector, particularly from the Wall Street side of, of the business. And it is why today we still see that money uh, trying to take safe haven in self-storage. So relative to our operating metrics, and I'm going to speak more on a macro basis because it's easier to do so and it doesn't violate any of my confidentiality agreements with specific clients. Um, but most of them are sharing almost the exact same sentiment, and this is the same for larger operators as for small. And, and that is that our uh, operations become bifurcated between the major metropolitan areas and everywhere else. And so I'm gonna speak kind of to the two different uh, venues because it makes a significant difference. So from an operating standpoint, uh, our occupancy and tenancy has not seen any kind of uh, withdrawal from the uh, pandemic. And as we try and move from pandemic to endemic, um, I, I think we'll see some variance in that, but we're still uh, greatly focused on the uh, new tenants coming in. So at the beginning of the uh, pandemic, we saw kind of a rush uh, in business in any town that was near a major university that had do uh, dormies, because the dormies all needed to vacate. And when they vacated, they did as they typically do in the summertime. When the dorms go uh, dormant, they uh, put that into self-storage and use self-storage. So we saw kind of a surge of business actually right at the beginning. Um, when we put a moratorium, which happened kind of nationwide on uh, the uh, lean eviction process, the lean process, which is how we evict tenants. And, and keep in mind that in self-storage, the one of the beauties of our business is that our lien laws are the most highly skewed toward the landlord as opposed to toward the tenant. And so we as owners have a great benefit from that because um, as long as we follow the statute, we are basically 45 days, maximum 60 days if we follow the statutes, um, the worst of them in California and Oregon, the best of them in, I believe, Nevada and South Dakota. At any rate, what happens is we're very able, very quickly able to recover our space. Um, in lieu of recovering that space, most of the operators are taking a, a buyout position, which is you go to the tenant that's past due and you ask the guest, would you vacate the space as a courtesy to me? Now, when we were under um, mobility restrictions and stay at home restrictions, we were not able to affect that because they couldn't get their space out. So we took uh, kind of a promises in lieu of and, and had them sign docs that says, uh, when I can within the next X number of days of the release of mobility, I will move out of my space. And so we saw a, a fair uh, amount of folks moving out, but there was sufficient demand to replace those spaces coming back in. So the net move in, move out, while the move out activity first was flat and then spiked as mobility opened up, it was immediately basically covered by incoming demand for those spaces. And we didn't see much of a diminution in occupancy metrics. Relative to collection uh, activity, because we went into the suspension of uh, collections uh, beyond telephone calls, um, and we did not, as an industry, pursue the lean process, uh, our collections who are usually limited to losses in our industry of around two to 2.3%, that's a typical self-storage property that's well-managed, will only lose that amount of money in economic occupancy over a year in rents um, because of collection losses. That number, we don't know the true collection loss because we just started the lien process again, which is 45 to 60 days. That really having been started early uh, in the June timeframe to mid-June timeframe. So now we'll see those units go to auction and we'll see what the affect is. But overall, our uh, 
uh, delinquency is now hovering somewhere between 5 and 7% uh, awaiting that final change and determination. So, you know, we, we look at it as not being devastating, but certainly look at it as being cautionary. When money from the CARES Act runs out and we no longer have that subsidy flowing in anymore, that to me will be a truer test of what our uh, guest base is going to do and how they're going to react. So in early April, I wrote an article on the pandemic and focused uh, on all the different affects, whether it be the, the owner, the staff, the lender, the acquirer, the developer, um, the city, and kind of went through each one of those relative to self-storage, how they were going to be affected potentially by uh, the pandemic and by the economic um, situation following it. And I drew a parallel between 9-11 and uh, what happened in the pandemic, because interestingly enough, the time frame was almost identical, and most of the rents and self-storage like multifamily, like retail and apartments and, and office is collected on the first of the month. However, about 20% nationwide of all of our tenant payments do not roll on the first of the month, but they roll on an anniversary date, which means whatever date of the month they moved into their space, that becomes their due date going forward. So we do have a, a pretty uh, isolation there of of tenants that are not even due on the first of the month, and so it's a little harder to track that. But we will see uh, once the rent money is uh, no longer being provided by, you know, unemployment, the unemployment extra and or the $2,400 number, um, we'll begin to see what that really does to our rent base and how it affects us. When I wrote that article, one of the things I said in the article was that uh, it is like 9-11. I drew that parallel. And I also said that self-storage has typically had the either benefit or detriment of being at a place on the food chain relative to payments. So people will pay uh, for their uh, basic living, that is the, the food, um, the things they have to have, medicines that they have to have in order to survive. You know, that's kind of at the top of the food chain, followed by uh, somewhere in, in there, the rent, your, your gasoline expenses. Um, and, and in self-storage, the one that's right before us is the cell phone. So they'll pay their cell phone bill typically before they'll pay their storage bill. And uh, it was interesting that a, a legislator in the city of Los Angeles picked up on my article and immediately went to the commission and wrote legislation to uh, have all self-storage rent payments suspended and was successful in getting it passed. I didn't even know about it because he never contacted me after the article was written, but the uh, CEO of our national trade organization contacted me and um, he said, I'm increasing your dues this year. And he said, you're, you, you know, you're going to get a bill for your dues that's going to be astronomical because you just cost me $64,000. And of course, you know, that was the entree for him telling me that they had hired an attorney to try and fight that legislation to lobby against it and ultimately were unsuccessful. We are told now there are another half a dozen or so uh, legislatures, mainly municipal, none that are state, that are also now trying to pass similar legislation that would freeze the rent payments on self-storage uh, for, for guests. So, you, you know, that's a, a, a very interesting situation to occur. And, and of course, I never dreamt in a million years that my lowly little article out on the internet there would get that kind of uh, play and get that kind of reaction to it. So it's interesting to look at that. You know, transactionally on a, on a bigger level, we are seeing uh, still high closing rates on properties that are for sale in self-storage. And we are also still seeing new listings coming to market. And the players in that are typically the cash buyers that uh, are not requiring a CMBS loan, but can go to a community bank or have lines of credit that are already established that have not been affected by the pandemic and are able to close. Um, 
uh, I personally, with one of my uh, very closest friends and largest client, uh, we are closing uh, an acquisition. We're trying to get it closed this afternoon, but uh, we'll see whether that yet happens. Um, if not, we should close tomorrow. We've got some survey and title issues, nothing that is uh, relative to uh, COVID or pandemic. And our lender, who is a CMBS lender, which I'm not permitted to disclose whose they are, uh, this will be the loan they close uh either today or tomorrow, uh, funding has not been inter uninterrupt it has not been interrupted, and they also closed a CMBS loan for us uh, 14 days ago uh, in Arizona. So we were able to close those loans without any issues. Um, we, we were only late in making the application because they were out of market when we were applying for financing. And as soon as they came back in and called us up and said, we're ready to continue taking on new debt, go ahead and bring the loans in. We did. And so we have not been um, negatively affected from that CMBS lender who, uh, by the way, is not a long warehouser. They, they tend to sell those in that market as quickly as they possibly can. But their track record so far has been uh, an offering they had that came out, I believe, in the first week of May. Uh, subscribed well, they sold well, and uh, they did strip out any retail, and they stripped out office, and they stripped out hospitality out of their asset classes. And we think that's We have one more person to go, so if you don't mind just wrapping sure. up. And that, uh, that primarily, I think, is what gave them the impetus to continue funding the CMBS loans. And Stephanie, your timing was great because that's pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we have someone else that just that joined by phone. Is that you, Chris? Hey, Stephanie. Chris, Christian Cascone, Tesla Homes on the East Coast. How are you? Excellent. Welcome. Thanks. Thanks. So uh, I, I just joined the call. I wasn't. I heard a little bit of the, the back end there of that. Um, can you just give me a, a quick overview of what talk, topics have been covered so I can uh, kind of chime in appropriately? So we were talking about what everyone is going through with their particular asset classes and markets, and everyone is in a different asset class and market. So <laughs> whatever. Okay. You well, we, 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 basically, uh, we basically do multifamily, and we also do, we're a little bit unique in that um, we do value add and, and some traditional investments. We own apartment complexes, and we, we've owned everything from um, in the vacation rental sector all the way up to apartment complexes. And and uh, we do a lot of uh, disruptive, disruptive tech VC first round, uh, you know, kind of capital investing in, in alternative assets and alternative classes as, as well. So um, quickly what we've done and, and we've taken from, from our network, what I've seen is we've taken a little bit of a different approach. Um, we've sort of decided to diversify more internationally. Uh, we have property in Central America throughout Europe. And, uh, and we've decided to focus more on those markets. Um, we see more stability in those markets. Um, we, we see that there, there's just too many unknowns. We're a little more conservative, even though we do a lot of, um, a lot of sort of um, initial rounds and, and investing in classes that most people wouldn't consider. Um, the, the market just has gotten uh, a little too unpredictable at this point, a little too overheated. Um, there's capital being injected in the wrong places. and. Uh, we feel like it's causing some problems in terms of the, you know, that the free market essentially is dead at this point, in our opinion. Um, these are, we see a lot of manipulated markets. We see a lot of markets that are sort of being favored, um, a lot of funds going into places where people want them to go, and, and a lot of propping up of, of sort of zombie industry and zombie companies and that kind of thing. So we don't really feel good about, um, you know, while we haven't seen a huge drop off in, in rental payments, we do see a lot of, um, late payments we see a lot of people uncertain and very fearful um and so you know from the multifamily perspective specifically we feel like there's there's some better real estate opportunities in other places through some of the research and due diligence we've been doing and through the networks we have around the world and so we've kind of been going and looking outside of taking this as an opportunity to, to further diversify our portfolio outside of of the u.s um, you know, we'll see if, you know, worst case scenario, if we're wrong there, then, then we just kind of stand pat with what we got and we're fine and maybe we miss a few opportunities along the way, but we're willing to do that to mitigate risk. Um, so I think, uh, you know, at this point, what we're trying to see is, is if there's, um, you know, if there's some, some chance, if there's really going to be some, some opportunities down the road for um, really high quality assets in great locations in the U.S., maybe 
say 12 to 18 months down the road, we're certainly open to those. We're seeing opportunity zones get hot again as people have huge capital gains that they're, they're able to deploy into, um, you know, away from things like, for example, stocks, and they can now put that into real estate. And so we've gotten a lot of, we're getting a lot of calls on ozones. We own some ozones. Um, and there's a lot of interest in that. And, and we would be interested in that as well. Um, as people look to deploy all these capital gains that, that they're selling here, we do feel like we're standing a little bit at the edge of the cliff, you know, um, on the uh, on the recovery curve. You know, this is sort of the, the return to normal phase. Those that are familiar with those curves, you know, you, the next thing is a precipitous drop. And we just don't know where that's going to happen. Uh, if it's going to happen, where it'll happen, how it'll manifest itself. Um, and so we're we're standing a little bit pat right now in the U.S. Thank you so much, Christian. And thank you all for joining. This was incredible and hopefully useful for each and every one of you. I really appreciate everyone being here. Yeah, thank you, everyone. That was a great call. I appreciate all your input and perspective on what's going on in your markets.